All right, so today's a pretty exciting day on uh, Tom Air. Just had an interesting opportunity present itself. Uh, a new friend of mine, uh, Mr. Stephen Lowe, and his wife are, uh, are wanting to go to Thunder Bay and uh, take a look at some, we're basically doing a tech scout for a potential film project that's coming up. So we're gonna look at, look at a whole bunch, of, whole bunch of the shoreline of the North Shore of Lake Huron, uh, Georgian Bay, Manitoulin Island, uh, through Sault Ste. Marie, and then onwards to Thunder Bay, and then uh, looking around the Thunder Bay area. Stephen Lowe is a famous Canadian. He's prolific. He's created more IMAX movies than any other Canadian. He's made over, he's, he's directed, produced, written uh, over 20, 20 large screen format films, a whole bunch of IMAX films. Um, he's really well known. Super exciting to get to meet him and hang out with him and have him in my airplane for you know, we're going to be, I'm going to have him held captive for four hours each way. So I'm going to, really looking forward to picking his brain, learning about, he's been, he's been in this world of shooting aerial, aerial video, large format aerial video for, whew, you know, since the, since it was created, since it was started. He's been bolting giant cameras onto helicopters since it was first, that technology was first available. He's seen it evolve, he's seen it develop. Um, he knows all about it. He knows we know a lot of the same people, so that's kind of cool. Um, but he's, you know, we're in the we're in the drone world. Little stuff, medium stuff, big stuff. A big a big drone for me is like this big. For him, his his IMAX cameras are, you know, certainly back in the day when it was filmed, they were gigantic. And I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing all about how they implemented that, how they how they put these cameras, you know, on helicopters, trains. He's he's put them on submersible vehicles and, and gone down he's he's been to the Titanic and he's filmed on the Titanic with IMAX grade cameras like this guy's a legend um, so yeah today's a pretty exciting day I'm picking him up uh, picking Stephen and his wife up in Montreal and then uh, we're flying onwards to Thunder Bay today the weather's a little little iffy um, yeah we'll look outside it's a little little gusty a little windy a little dark um, but We've done our flight planning, it looks good. It's definitely IFR kind of day. Um, we're on the tail end of a cold front, so cold fronts just finished passing through. So we're seeing, seeing some of that. Uh, by later on in the day, it should have cleared out a fair amount. By the time we get to, by the time we get to uh, Superior, certainly, or even by the time we get to Georgian Bay, things are gonna be looking a lot better. I mean, according to the weather, the weather always changes. That's what it does. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a flyable day. Uh, might be a little bumpy going into uh, Montreal, into Pierre Elliott Trudeau. That's the other thing that's going on today, flying into a really big airport. Um, like normally, general aviation, uh, we try to we normally fly into smaller airports. The big airports try to keep us away um, because we're, we're sort of in their way. You know, little guys like us, we move a little slower. Um, so we have, to book, we have to book a time slot in and out. So I got to hit that time slot, plus or minus 15 minutes. Um, yeah, it's going to be a lot going on. It's going to be very busy going in and out of Pierre Alley and Trudeau this afternoon, early afternoon. So looking forward to that. A little apprehensive about that, but I think it's going to be an excellent experience and I am well prepared. So let's see how it goes. So, uh, departing, departing Brantford uh, about a half hour ago, and uh, we've got our IFR clearance into Montreal, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Weather's a little shittier than anticipated. Uh, there's a storm that's, there's a, basically a cold front that's just passed through. Um, we were hoping it would be moved along a little bit further, but uh, to the southeast. Um, we're sort of just traveling along the north of the track of, of yucky weather. Uh, the last little bit into Montreal might get a little, a little rough. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fine. Good. Good. Glad I got my 35, IFR. 62, that's for sure. IFR currency is very handy. Uh, it like good. Uh, morning, it doesn't panel, but I can actually see what's going on. Romeo, Bravo, Romeo, via full, full, cleared ILS approach, runway 06 right. Uh, Romeo, Bravo, Romeo, cleared the ILS uh, 06 right via full, full. Romeo Bravo Romeo, Montreal Tower number one, continue the approach. The wind is 02015, gusting 22, plan exiting at Lima. Uh, continue the approach, Gulf Romeo Bravo Romeo. 
go to land runway 06 right. Uh, clear to land 06 right and uh, planning to exit the first right at Lima for Romeo Bravo Romeo. Romeo Bravo Romeo, and where are you parking? Uh, we're going to Shell Aero Center. Romeo Bravo Romeo, Roger, plan exit Lima, that'll be the first exit to the right. Romeo Bravo Romeo, exit right at Lima, contact ground, 1219 clear. Romeo Bravo Romeo, tower line up on way 06 right. Uh, lining up 06 right for Romeo Bravo Romeo. Perfect. Romeo Bravo Romeo, airborne, turn left heading 350, contact departure established on the heading, wind 02016, gusting 23, clear for takeoff on way 06 right. Uh, clear for takeoff 06 right on uh, takeoff, turning to uh, 350 for Romeo Bravo Romeo. Delta Romeo Bravo Romeo Material Terminal. Uh, maintain 5,000. Uh, 5,000 Romeo Bravo Romeo, and we're heading 350, correct? Affirmative. So while we're out here in the middle of the big lake, do you, do you have time to uh, chat about chat about your life a little? And one ready to send seven thousand. I'll build my life. Yeah. Oh, you're exciting, right? One ready down to seven thousand. I was hoping to do a, a talk. Now that I have you captive in my airplane, I was hoping to do a uh, ta interview for Tom Aaron. You can tell me all about your history making IMAX films, or tell me about whatever you want. Or you don't have to tell me about anything. You can just nap too if you want, but. I just well, find I just find it really ironic that I'm I find I'm in an airplane for a fairly long period of time with a guy who does kind of the same thing as me, but you started obviously you started in the what 70s, right? This is Stephen Lowe, by the way, of uh, Canada's hi, hi, where's Canada's Frank? most you're uh, either Mostly one. You can there. look at that one or you can look at that one. Stephen Lowe, Canada's most prolific. I think you're the Canada's most prolific IMAX director and yes. producer, correct? Yeah, yeah, I think so now. Yeah. Do you have? You have made over 20, or you've made 20 IMAX films, is that right? Yeah, I think we're on the 21st or something. Excellent. Because, I mean, obviously I do aerial cinematography, but in, you know, in 2023, it's a, it's a whole different ball game when you started out in, wh when was your first film? It was in the 70s, was it not? No, my first uh, IMAX film was uh, in the early 80s. Early 80s. So your cameras were probably almost as big as the, the, yeah, the cockpit airplane. on this airplane. <laughs> yeah, the aerial camera we would have used is, is, uh, would have been about 50 pounds. Well, that's not as much as I th would have thought. But that well, would be a lightweight IMAX camera. Yes. Right. Uh, the heavyweight was more like 100 pounds. And uh, 
we had to reload every three minutes. So wow. if you had the camera on the outside, uh, you had to stop. And if it's an airplane, well, it's a big deal. So you'd go up and you'd only you'd only get three minutes, three and then minutes you'd have low. to land again, and yeah. you'd have to reload. No, we never did that in in submarines or air, or airplanes of any kind. Um, helicopters, no, you had to land. Yeah, helicopters, you have to land. Um, even with the, even with the modern gyro stabilizers, you you know you have to land have every to three land. minutes. Yeah. Uh, some of the fellows we made were really fun because you're you're chasing. Uh, let's say the zero seven contact on every terminal one one nine or two. And uh, terminal nine. It didn't have the, we didn't have the permission to hold it, so, because uh, it was on the main line, so we'd have to land, reload, refuel sometimes every second or third load, and then we have to chase the train, contact me, one, three, two, two. and go ahead of it Stay and scout it, to make sure that the, the there's no cables are in and then we go Thanks back and get the engine. Say, one, and, then we, and then we'd have to accept the topography as is. So when you started, were, your, were the initial cameras actually gyro stabilized, or were, were they were they stabilized heads, no. or were they just hard mounted to the to the aircraft? The aircraft stuff is what I'm really interested. In. Any of it I'm interested in, but especially the aviation, the aerial cinematography. No, uh, initially, uh, I believe that. Uh, we were mostly door mounts, which were Tyler mounts. So hard mounted, out the, out no, open not hard mounted. They would be on a, on a Tyler, which would have some sort of oh, okay. uh, um, stability. I'm not sure Tyler's were gyro stabilized. I didn't do a lot of. I didn't do a lot of aerials at first because I didn't like the vibration. Right. So I would use, I would go to huge lengths, use a giant crane, for instance. We would bring, on beavers, we used a huge crane, a construction crane, and we'd fly around on a bucket, just, just to get perfect lack of vibration. And in minutia, sort of what you're doing with drones now, we wanted to get really close, like a bird would, to a tree. And you can't do that with a helicopter. So we use cranes, buckets. Right. It's very, very hard to do, but at least they were stable. Go, Echo, Alpha, Alpha. So how high could you get with a with a bucket? You're, t so you're talking like a man lift kind of thing. That's no, no, like a, like a like a, a movie crane. Like a no, film. not a movie crane. Like, like an air, like an industrial crane. A construction crane. Oh, okay. Like way up in the air, where they would pull us way up in the air. And how would you keep the camera so from spinning around? around? We'd have three guys on ropes. And, tr and they'd be working together, uh, and uh, on that famous beaver shot, uh, we we have rehearsed it ten times and never got it. Too hard to do, because it's hard for the the ropers to co to communicate and really understand how to hold it steady. And if you're flying it up fast, yeah, it's really hard to do. So we finally, the light was getting really beautiful. Uh, I had not seen a good shot yet. We hadn't shot it. Uh, we were trying to release a beaver at the same time out across the lake. So he'd swim out with a stick in the same shot. So all of that never worked. The beaver would go, the, the crane was flying all over. You know, we were twisting like this. Yeah. No, I've worked with cranes and I've seen. They're a mess. We used to. In one of my, like, we used to do performance stuff with aerialists. We used to hang circus performers from yeah. trains. And it's the yeah, same yeah. thing. The biggest thing was they'd always spin. We actually made a device you could attach to the ball so you could actually control the yaw on a on an industrial crane. But it's tricky as heck oh, to, it's tricky. to do. Because so, then the cable spins above yeah, yeah. that. So, so anyway, we did it once. The light was stunning. The shot was absolutely perfect. And the beaver came out under the, the bottom of the frame when carrying this big log Perfect. out into the center of the lake with beautiful light and it's it just stunned us all. Like, and you how have, did we do that? And you had live playback on that. So no, you, have no. a monitor, you don't even have playback. No. Oh, hell no. So you're just pointing it and hoping for the best. Well, we had a... Well, I guess you're framing so wide because it's IMAX, but, but you're still trying to frame it center, center bottom of the frame for an IMAX. Theater. Oh, you had to frame, but use the viewfinder. Either, either a, a beam splitter or just a rangefinder. Oh my head. Oh yeah, yeah. And often, we, what we would do, if it was a fixed shot, we we 
we take the beam splitter out and shoot blind. Okay. If it was locked. Yeah. But if it's moving, you use a rangefinder. We did not use the beam splitter while the camera was rolling, because the cameraman, Leo Zordemus, sadly died in a plane crash. But so the beam splitter sends half of the, half of the light correct. to the eyepiece, the other half to the film. Right. Okay, I gotcha. I've never worked with film. Like I'm in the I'm a I'm a digital baby. Right. I grew up with film, like shooting film stills when I was a kid. I had a dark room, but I'm since I've been in film or film in quotation marks, it's it's been digital film. Right. 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 So it's uh, you know, we've had hour long reels we've had yeah, you yeah. know it's just a different world like not three minutes like we're so like I, I think sometimes our days are hard and then i think back to the old days you know and it's i can't even imagine no here's the basic principle behind imax is that the the as the format grows the depth of field decreases because the because your your lens look the long lens if you're using a 40 mil it's it's uh, when you put it on a on a big piece of film, ten times bigger than 35 millimeter, then it get the lenses are getting wider and wider with the same 40 mil. So, you so your not, depth of field is your depth infinite, of field is a, is that of a long lens, but you're shooting wide angle. Okay. So so you, so you have worse. a shallow you have a shallow depth of field. Yes. Okay. Getting more and more shallow as your format increases. You don't get it's basic physics. You don't get something for nothing. You have to pay the price if you want optics to fill that big frame. You've got to pay a huge price. So focus is critical for you guys. Like it's it's nuts. Yeah. So so you're measuring every you're measuring every shot. You're absolutely measuring, and and uh, we use uh, a lot of uh, HMI, a lot of lights generators, even in the forest. So we're lighting Beaver's face. He's got a dark face. And our lens, a 40 millimeter lens, is is slow because it's 40 mil, and and so we so we have to shut it down to 11, 16. Okay. And so you're shooting 11, 16, which is really hard uh, to get minimal depth. Of what do you mean 11, 16? So f stop f like between 11 and 16. Between 11 and 16. Okay. Like. Uh, and then these lenses must have been custom yeah, for the, the IMAX camera. No, no, uh, very few were built. The, the Omnimax lens was built for IMAX, but basically they use Hasselblad, Zeiss yeah, Hass Hasselblad yeah, lenses yeah. from large format still cameras, which meant that they weren't, still cameras don't need speed very much because you can always slow the yeah. exposure down, so, or increase the, the exposure. So, yeah. um, you know, IMAX could have developed better lenses that would have been wider angle and a little faster. But, you know, that you pay. If, if your lens is faster, you pay in depth of field. Right. No matter what. Yeah. No, that's the battle with us all the time, too, is... Oh, you don't have a battle with yeah, digital. Yeah, we don't have a battle. No, we do. We have a battle with, with light, for sure. And, I mean, but we're starting to actually succumb... We're starting to, to conquer that a little bit with the, the quality of the sensors and the noise and dual native things like dual native ISO like yes. the new the new Inspire 3 which is literally going to be delivered hopefully the day or two after I get home dual native ISO so it shoots I think it's 400 is on the low and then 2000 is the right. high yeah. so it's like okay it's dark let's put it on 2000 and it's still crystal clear yeah, no we did. noise very little noise we so did, we did a lot of shooting in the dark with the Venice yeah Venice is amazing Sony yeah. makes amazing Shocking. sensors for low light Shocking. They can see in the those cameras can see in the dark. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we would film a railway yard in the in the night and you know do twenty thousand ASA and and you know fantastic depth of field. I love the super wide angles because they're really good for underwater. Right. Uh, where where you want the widest you can. On the Titanic, we used uh, we used the uh, thirty mil, which is a fish eye. Okay. So we had 10,000 feet piled to the ceiling, and we had to reload every three minutes. So you're in a, just, yeah, Nightmare. so set the context. What year was this? 90. The 90s. So you're in the Alvin submarine diving 12,000? No, no. Uh, we would never have used Alvin in those days. Okay. What did you use? Because it didn't have the power. We used uh, uh, the brand new Mirrors. The Mirror submarine, 12,000 feet down, shooting the Titanic for your film Titanic. 12,500 yeah. feet underwater. 18-hour dive. 18-hour dive. Yeah. 
three guys, one loading all the time, peeing all. He had to pee. Well, you got to pee. Oh. What, you got to pee. You said the loader did because he was working. Yeah. The, the other two guys, the pilot, me, we didn't pee because we because we remain static. Your okay. body doesn't need to use the water. Yeah. So the loader is constantly hours. peeing. Oh, okay. No, that's a little unknown fact. Well, I know that. When I get in the airplane, I can fly as long as I want, and then when I get where I'm going, as soon as I get out, i got to pee pretty bad, because I start moving around. But I didn't actually ever equate it to lack of motion, so that's good to know. Um, yeah, <coughs> so that you must have built a, was there a special port, or you were just shooting through the pre-existing ports in the MERS submers submersible? Through the, through the center port. Okay, and it was it flat or it was it would it would be convex. No, it, ha it, it has to be, to be flat. Oh, it has to be flat. So for you. So, so you got you got a disadvantage, right? You're you're magnifying 33 percent. So when you use a you use the 30 mil, you're getting a fish eye, um, which with some distortion, but you hardly notice it. Typically, we use the 40 mil, and the 40 mil fits nicely in the port. And how thick was that, was that glass? Uh, I, I would think six inches. So the quality was very, very good. Um, we tried to shut down a little bit, but because we're only, because our uh, focus is quite, you know, it's eight feet out, and you don't really need to focus underwater. I had fights with the cameraman who, you know, pulled out the American cinematographer and gave me a lecture. And when we did demos in the in the real water with that port, uh, you just need to set it as a almost a fixed lens. So if you were shooting, we slowed the camera down to give us more depth of field, so we could shut the lens a little bit. But we were focused eight feet out, eight to ten feet, something like that. You can't tell the difference. No, it's not very. For most of your shots, I, I'd imagine most of your shots were fairly tight. Sh tight shots. I haven't seen the film. Um, well, no, yes and no. And the reason, the, I started out with Alvin and, and Bob Ballard way back. Uh, when he first discovered it, I was with him doing tests with Alvin. So, 85. I was just a young guy and I was, he had agreed that we'd do it in IMAX and I was trying to sell that. And I had a sponsor at Mars Bars. So what happened though was that he got into a fight with the French he took all the rights and the credit and everything. And the, the French Nautil uh, Ipremer decided not to go on the on the first expedition. Okay. Uh, and so we didn't go. We decided to pull the plug because one Alvin with a few light bulbs was no good. But in the meantime, what happened is that the Russians came online with a lot more power. They built two submarines based on the Canadian Pisces out of Vancouver. That was a very good sub, but they built bigger and better versions of it with the help of the Canadians and the Finlanders. The Finland, uh, uh, fin Rama Rapola built them. Well, they're not Russian-built subs, okay. but they owed money to the Russians and they they took care of some of their exchange with products. So they built these beautiful submarines. And uh, then we had two subs. So that's double the light to, to frame stuff. So we could see maybe 50 feet out in the water column if you could see something lit, backlit, and had practical light in the shot, which is really important. Um, Would you put external lights, or you'd only have the light from the well, here's, here's what we did. Uh, Al Giddings was working with James Cameron in Hollywood at the time. And uh, they were developing underwater HMIs. And, and uh, they were daylight temperature lights with, with a lot more power. And so we developed eight of those uh, out, with a company out of San Diego, Deep Sea Power and Light. So we got these eight huge 1200 watt eight HMIs on these two booms and we tested them and so on and so forth but so those would be on another MERS submersible yeah well no there was four on each okay so, so yeah, there's together. two two subs total yeah okay so we got eight lights on two subs and does each sub have a camera or you've got one with a camera and one one's just a one's light no both had cameras 
So they're each lighting each other and they're each filming? Yeah. Uh, filming. Okay, yeah. makes sense. So the budget must have just been astronomical or oh, something yeah. like that, right? In today's dollars, that you couldn't do it. Yeah. 20 million or something. The, the, the subs alone, I mean, the Russians were subsidizing because they wanted to work with with uh, Canadians. They wanted to join the Western world. And Those were the days, eh? Oh, yeah, they were fantastic to deal with. So a lot of money, a little bit of money went a long way. So I think our, our cruise was $2 million in those days, U.S. Um, but, you know, that's pin money for, for a ship and submarine. Yeah, no, that's... And, uh, nowadays, that doesn't seem like that doesn't seem like anything. No, it's probably so... Two, four, six, eight, you know, probably paid them eight, ten, eight, ten, eight, nine million dollars. And even that wouldn't cover it. You know? yeah. The terrifying thing about the whole project was that we were in Newfoundland, I think, St. John's, and uh, we were doing some, oh, uh, was it? Yeah, St. John's. We were doing some preliminary test dives with scuba gear and stuff, just to check the lighting and stuff. We got all set to go, and we got a, we got a, call from Toronto, a telex from Toronto, that said... Telex? Tel What's a telex? Wh whatever it was, like a, <laughs> yeah, a yeah. fax, a fax yeah. from t from Toronto that said, we we, we didn't, uh, we are not going because uh, the money fell, some of the money fell through and the company couldn't afford it. Filmmakers' scariest moments. Yeah, and I yeah, said... You're to, ready to go and you... I said to uh, the Russians, let's get the hell out of here. Pretend, pretend we never pretend, got it. Let's pretend we didn't get the, uh, yeah, pretend we That's didn't get That's what we this. did. Yeah. Because no. I had already paid for the vodka and I uh, paid him a uh. million dollars and I said no. So, so we already had the film. We paid for the film and the cameras and the submarines. And I, I was the smartest, I guess, of the, or the, the most selfish. And I said, go or go got to go yeah. and it's very scary if you get bad weather you could be you could be weathered could out for, for how many so how many weeks how many weeks i think we had two weeks and so we had a weather window we had a hurricane on the way there a five four six horse hurricane beat the shit out of this the whole crew and uh but then when we started diving it was it was beautiful oh man and then were you just diving every day, or was yeah, we had a we had uh, we were launching both subs every day because I was scared that yeah, I needed one, two, enough three, footage one, three, to pay for it all. Yeah. And then we got a storm and had to recover subs in the storm, and that was scary as hell. But it got some nice footage from the ship. So, and that's scary because you have no plan B. You have to get back on the ship yeah. or spend a week. Or no. go all the way back to shore and then go all the way back out, but by then the money's used up and there's no second. Well, you can't go to shore and leave the subs in the water. No, no, no. You've got to recover the subs. Yeah, yeah. And that ri it's a life-risking process. Because once the, it's stormy, it's hard as hell to get it. you got to get them out of the water, but it gets harder to get them out of right. the water. That's right. It gets more and more desperate. Yeah. If you're on the bottom yeah. and they call you, and they did, come now, you know it's a storm. How long does it take to get from tops from surface to 12,000 I think of four hours Jeez. and so is there eight like hour. is the submarine creaking and groaning and going beep, making weird noises yeah uh, not not uh, yeah what you get was was so, somewhat the lights would blow up <coughs> would blow up sometimes blow up Boom. bam and uh, so here's the here's the trick is that the, the most dangerous part was around 3,000 feet because that is the most likely um, that the oh, that's a critical depth. Or yeah, the bulbs can do the most damage at 3,000, but they're less likely to blow up. The deeper you go, the more likely they are to blow up, but the less damage they do. Or you just die in a heartbeat. You don't even know, so you don't suffer no, they, so much. We heard a bang, and 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 the at ten, at 10,000, I remember we had some explosions, but, you know, you just have a, kind of shakes the sub, but it's a, it's a known factor. And is there, can they blow the ballast and can they get you to the surface quickly if need be? 
or yeah, the Russians, the Russians, uh, unlike the uh, Alvin, used the pump pumping ballast because they had a lot more power, of course, a lot of more electrical power. So we used ballast typically non uh, analog, if you will. We used uh, air ballast. And they did so because it was cheaper, right. in a way. Now, there are a bunch of systems that you can use to release a sub-sphere. You can actually let the sub go and, and just release the sphere. You so can, the sphere is the part with humans in it? Where you're in it. The rest is just all the working guts. Systems. Pumps and systems. And, and then stuff. you just bob up like a, bump, like a bubble. Right. But you could come up under the ship, you could come up you know, Absolutely. miles from the ship, you yeah. can come up anywhere. The last ditch. Did so, they put a? Were they just? Were they just using that bow thrusters and stuff to stay in place, or did they? What did they have? It, there's no anchor down. There's no anchor line no. to hold in place. Oh no, you don't want anything that like that. No, no. nothing. And you could twelve thousand five hundred feet. I mean, that's there's no be tether impossible. because if the tether broke, it would it would trap you. Right. So. Yeah, because normally, like when we dive, we go. We're always down. I mean, I dive in Lake Ontario. We go down 100 feet, 200 feet. You know, we follow the anchor line. The anchor line is our. Yeah, our, no. That's where we need to be. Otherwise, you're just in the. You're just drifting, and you don't even know where you are. So typically, we'd arrive at the wreck, and we'd set out three three transponders, beacons that would be um, that you could navigate with. But sonar. So those are attached to the bottom, then, or those are on weights or something. They're on weights, uh, and they have an auto release after so many hours. Oh, okay. So they and do you guys recover them on the surface? You try, yeah. You try to, because they're probably expensive as they well. They are very expensive. <laughs> they're good for, you oh know, 20,000 feet. I mean, it was fun, but hairy as hell. Yeah. Those, uh, Titanic is a, it's like a sailing ship. It's just rigged. It's just got a uh, cable everywhere to hold the mat, to hold the, the stacks up, you know, they're they're held together with cables yeah. and the masts are cable head. You know, not the modern ships aren't, but the, those old ones are really dangerous. Yeah, uh, you could get caught in the in the, some cable you didn't see. Yeah. So it was very risky stuff. So how many dives on the Titanic to in order to 18. get enough? Uh, over two weeks or yeah, about ten, yeah, it's about two weeks. And one trip, one expedition, though. Yeah, we made it. We nailed it. We've got lots of footage, and and you know the weakness of the film, in in retrospect, is we we couldn't really explain the story of the sinking. You know, that's something that Cameron did, you know, very well with with the, you know five hundred million dollars. Uh, yeah. You know, we had ten million. And it all was used for the expedition. So I knew that the film was inherently weak in that respect, but it was, a, you know, a real look at the wreck in those days was a big deal. And it did really well. And was that the first time the wreck had been seen, sort of made more mainstream? Properly. Properly. Yeah. Wow. So scientists like Ballard, he didn't know anything about light. So he'd have, you know, three little tungsten bulbs. Yeah. And he didn't give a shit about filming. He used a little video camera. So he was looking for science. He wasn't looking for. No, he was yeah, so looking to promote himself basically. And he had NTSC cameras. So how did you end up being the guy who got to do this this gig? I mean, that seems like a pretty. Uh, I mean, you're a Canadian for one. I always just assume that Canadians don't get the good gigs. Um, how did you manage to work your way up up to you know doing the a job that that amazing? Well, IMAX was a Canadian company then, and uh, the the guys that bought it, they did they weren't interested in documentaries or science films or anything. They they wanted to get their heads into Hollywood, so they wouldn't have given us money anyway. So after after they sold, after IMAX was sold, the interest in documentaries went down the drain, and so. Who bought IMAX? IMAX got sold to the states. Yeah, to, to some uh, some guys in in uh, Wall Street right, of who course. wanted to connect themselves with with the Hollywood. And so their vision was to blow up stuff. Uh, initially, they thought they would film in IMAX, but I did the first drama 
Well, Jean-Jacques Cano and I did the first two dramas. What and was that? What films were those? Uh, his, I forget the name of his. Mine was Across the Sea of Time, and it was a, it was a little drama about a kid in 3D IMAX. So we had our 300-pound camera all over New York. And, and, um, it was a good film, but it proved that Hollywood couldn't afford just to have a 50-man crew and, and a 20-minute reload. It just didn't work financially. Jean-Jacques proved that as well. He ate it. Nightmare. I watched a uh, little a little IMAX film. I mean, it was just on YouTube, so I know that's not the way to watch IMAX films. But I watched North of Superior right. the other day because somebody said somebody on my Facebook. I posted some photos of our our trip up along the North Shore of Superior, and they said, "Oh, it looks like the film North of Superior." And I said, "Oh, funny you should say that." I didn't go into detail, but uh, I thought that was interesting. It was a fun. Obviously, it was a very. I mean, that was original bolt hard mounting to the outside. Yeah, that was aircraft. a aircraft. That was a twin. The twin, yeah. Prop. There was some helicopter. I could see when they switched from the twin to it's the helicopter. I loved the, I, It was very shaky, but you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of FPV, the first-person view drones that we have now. All of a sudden, it's the same thing. We're we're not stabilized anymore. People want the 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 yaw pitch and the roll, the way the actual aircraft is flying, to, to see the flight dynamics, to add excitement to it. Yeah, but but, but the vibration is not pleasant Vibration's on never a big a good screen. Thing. No, vibration's no. never a good thing. That, uh, that little pipe, I think it was a piper that they used, they, it, it was a pretty good mount. And I don't mind a bumpiness, I just don't like vibration. I thought it was cool that they left the, uh, well they left it in, they had to, because it was there, the shadow. You yeah. could always see what they were flying, because you would see the shadow of the aircraft they were flying. Well that was made by Graham Ferguson, and he was one of the partners of IMAX. So there were two filmmakers in IMAX, and the other two were engineers and businessmen. So Graham and Roman Freuder were the were the filmmakers, and their passion were, was making films. But you know, quickly they realized that that it wasn't a slam dunk. That the theaters were very fussy. Uh, they didn't really want much science or education, and it was really a bo it had a box office component. It's been topic, often trumped um, narrative storytelling, even documentary narrative. Right. People wanted roller coasters and yeah, they wanted and the, the story of the volcano or the right. story of the whale. It's got yeah. to end by blowing up or something. Yeah, it had to be visually spectacular. And, yeah. and there's a guy in Hollywood called McGilvery, yeah. Greg McGilvery, who sort of did the topics and I tried to follow more a little more of the film board style of narrative document theatrical narrative and so he was more successful on the, at, at the box office um, because he would say here's a film about Everest you know um, which was quite a feat but most of the footage was shot in California sure but you know, I always favored the uh, the story, so, you know, I was anxious to do narrative-based, even if it was natural history, you know, the beaver story, story was a family of beavers building and surviving the winter, and, and I, you know, I did it subtly, but you know, it's, it's not just a film about beavers, it's, it's a specific family building a dam and a, and a house, and, and I thought that was important. But I just, uh, I had disagreements with Roman, who was half kind of narrative guy. He did some beautiful narrative films at the film board as a young man. But later on, he became more topic oriented because he felt IMAX was, you know, was was leaning towards topic and not story. Right. But off topic a little bit. Well, it's not actually, but have you seen that film on Netflix? I don't know if you watch Netflix, being an IMAX yeah. guy. The uh, Chimp, Chimp Empire? No, I didn't. You, you should really check out, if you like narrative, if you like uh, theatrical narrative of, uh, of animals, Chimp Empire is a four-part special on Netflix right now, and it's the most amazing insight into the life of these chimpanzees, these two chimpanzee groups in Africa. Oh yeah, well I it's worked on uh, with Jane Goodall on, on a chip film. Right. 
though. I did, I wrote uh, the chip film, and I know about the wars between the groups wars and between the groups. These these guys have the most intimate coverage of that kind of stuff that I've ever seen. And well, that's absolutely remarkable. That's modern, you know. Modern cameras. That's what the, I the, listened to a a podcast with the filmmaker, and he's saying the only reason they could do it is because the cameras were this big. And but you ro and you can roll them all day long, they, and they have huge depth of field. Even the they long shot lenses. for four hundred days. Yeah, 400 days. Yeah. So, so when we did Jane Goodall, uh, you could get real close because they were climatized to to people, and it's it's Same. a it's a rare uh, case of that you can do that with wild animals. Although I say, same with these ones. This was a science. Ba this has been a science base for oh, yeah. for so 10 or 20 years or something. So they're used to humans. The humans aren't even there. I mean, so they don't even they don't even pay any attention to them. That's this the only must way. have been. Uh, uh, Jane Goodall's camp. No, it was a different camp. Uh, in, it was in Gogo in oh. uh, Africa. But it's a very, very... Well, this was... Jane was in Gombe. Yeah. Different spot. Different, but because they, they talked about they talked about Jane Goodall's thing on the podcast I was listening to. But it was just incredible. You should, I highly, highly recommend it. It's a great four-part series. We just loved it. So, it, it seemed like you did a lot of you did some natural history, but then you did a lot of like industrial stuff too. You did trains, chase trains around a fair amount. Uh, what are you? What were some of the other other subjects? You, you oh, covered? we did almost everything, but it, it it because we were no longer connected to IMAX. We didn't have a national film board. We had you know the, the we had the job of raising the money each time, and that was hard. So we depended on a Japanese World's Fair or a or a or a uh, an enlightened sponsor who was interested in education. So what? The, yeah, this Japanese World's Fair. They wanted a film about what was it? Nuclear energy, and then you sold them a film about beavers. What's the yeah. story there? How do you? It uh, sounds like a pretty uh, sharp, sharp, bright turn. Well, the first the, the, the first film was was sponsored uh, that we did with that I did with, with IMAX, and they organized for me to shoot. To, to direct it. <clears throat> it was a film about man and birds. It was more topic than... That's where Roman and I disagreed. I, I said, we got to do one story of birds, you know, the life cycle of a goose or something. And he said, no, no, we got to film in Japan and all over the world. The Japanese want to go everywhere. So the first one was, in my mind, was a compromise. And we, did, we trained uh, 20 Canada geese to fly with a speedboat. We were the first to do that, and uh, so we could film them inches away from the camera at full speed. Wow! And uh, they, a lot of people have done it afterwards, and uh, but we were the first to do it with the boat and then an ultralight, and that was skyward. It did really well in Japan. They, the Japanese loved it, so we got a call from IMAX first, who said that Chibu, this giant power company is building a theater and they want a film about nuclear power so we don't want to do that film in other words Roman and Graham because they didn't think it would be a hit it would be just pretty limited uh, very yeah, limited. limited so I went you know on my own or with the endorsement of, of Roman and, and IMAX and sat with the uh, board of directors who had just shown me their walkthrough a nuclear reactor mock-up which the families could walk inside and then they come out of that and they go th there was a, a, a theater being constructed beside it an IMAX theater so they introduced me to this and they sat me at the board room table and they were all the Japanese were all chain smoking yeah. and, and uh, they I was said, in Japan in the 90s I remember this oh yeah smoking. Well, this was the 80s. So oh, was I remember worse. seeing ashtrays on fire. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. It was everyone chain smoked. Yeah. Even the translator, who, who still a friend of mine, uh, Takashi Yodano, who spoke pretty good English. And so uh, through him, they, they explained that they wanted it, the, the film to be the same as the, as the, as the visitor center, of a story of how nuclear power works and all of this stuff. And it was... So I said, what's the, what's the audience? They said, oh, well, women and children, mainly. Mainly women and children who take, it's the women who take their children to, 
to these visitors. Because the men are all, sal the salary men are all working. They're, you know, we're drunk. We're drunk. So, yeah. Or both. Or both. At the same time. So, um, so, anyway, there's this huge cloud of smoke and the whole board was there. They, they really considered this important. And, and you know, the IMAX had said that I was very capable, and they had liked Skyward with the birds and the, and the pelicans and all this stuff. So I said, no, I, I don't think it's a good idea because then you'd have too much <coughs> overindulgence in the nuclear power story because you're going to have a, a walkthrough tour, a, you know, a, a guide telling you all about nuclear power. So what do you want a movie about that? So I, so they said, oh, Mr. Lowe, you, you crazy. Uh, your daughter was very negative. He said, oh, they don't like that. They don't like that you said no. So they said, Mr. Lowe, uh, okay, what do you want? What do you say? And I thought for a few minutes and I remembered uh, a moment I'd spent with a librarian a long time ago who told me that the number one popular thing in the, in the, nor in the North for ch children were be was a film books about beavers. So I said, well, you need a film about beavers. And what better person to make it than a Canadian? Right, and beavers, and oh no, Mr. Lowe, no, this is a bad film. And, and I said, why, they're engineers. Oh, so they're getting, the Japanese like Contradictions. They like those contrast. Kinds of they like contrast. contrast. Yeah, it's a yeah. land of contrast. I mean, that's what I found when I was there. The cities were the biggest, most elaborate, technologically advanced cities that I'd ever seen in my life. And then I'd go to the country, and, and it was like it was just like going back a thousand years. Thousand years, and there was people just living living the old ways with like in, in little huts and just. I love that. It was just incre incredible. And Anyway, so they said, uh, go home. I, I said, I said to Yudano, I whispered, Yudano, how's it going? Because they were talking for a long time. And uh, Yudano said to me, oh, Stevenson, uh, uh, not good. <laughs> not good. Uh, it's time to go to the airport. <laughs> so I went home and we forgot about it. We worked, we started on other things we were working on. And one day, uh, through the grapevine, you know, my secretary says uh, Japan's on the line and uh, it's a young lady from Chibu Electric Power the biggest power company in the world at the time and uh, she said oh Mr. Lowe uh, we uh, we basically she, her English was poor so we think you're crazy <laughs> uh, but we respect you and we want the beaver film we decided okay. the beavers where do we send the money <laughs> So they put like five million dollars on in a bank account and we settled on a couple of bottles of sake later on okay no contract yeah and so um they work on honor you're either honorable or you're not right so they decided i was honorable somehow they told me years later which i really impressed me i said you don't know we were in the casino and because he loved the casino all Japanese love, yes. businessmen love casinos. We were in a casino in Vegas and I said, this was like 20, 30 years later, I said, uh, Yodano, um, how did you come to, uh, why, why did you give me this so much money uh, without knowing who I was? And uh, Yodano said, oh, Stevenson, we knew exactly who you were. <laughs> That's all he said. I'll bet they did. That was great honor. And I and I delivered. You know? So they got the film to play at their nuclear play, their well, nuclear it took three years educational to make. place, and then you got to play it at, on IMAX screens. I owned the, uh, the rights the internationally because okay. they didn't care. Yeah. And they didn't think it would be a hit. They didn't even think it would be a hit in, in, in their own theater. So, so you then sell it to IMAX? Uh, individually, the yeah. IMAX theaters. We, yeah. we w kept the distribution. IMAX wanted the distribution after the fact, but they had turned me down for some support. I wanted some camera support and stuff, and I brought I brought a beaver into the boardroom in a in a <laughs> plastic pool, 
<laughs> and there's a beaver sitting as part in the of pool your pitch? as part of my pitch, swimming around this like swimming pool in the boardroom. Okay. And uh, the boss, Graham, who was who was sort of the other side. I was aligned with Roman, and Graham was kind of on the other. They were sort of a bit com competitive. You know, they wanted money for their own things, and so. <clears throat> Basically, Graham said, oh, they look like wet rats. That's yeah. what he told when they I left the room, which is true. That yeah, is true. When I left the room, he turned it down. And so, when the film was made, I kept... Right. They wanted the distribution rights back, but I said, you turned it down. Yeah, it worked out better for you. It sure did. Okay. So, anyway, we had to... Three years we worked in the, in the wilderness, raising baby beavers to be adults. And building back, building a dam, building, cutting trees, building. So a would house. you build it as a like you, your prop department and your set department would build it, or no. would the beaver you would let the beaver you would help facilitate the beavers to build. Both. So no, no, no. Uh, well, in the case of the, I I took a, almost a year to find a beaver house and and beaver dam that would do justice to IMAC. So I traveled all over <laughs> British Columbia and Alberta, and I finally on Christmas Eve. I, I was giving up. I was following a creek up a road in the wilderness alone. And holy shit, I came around the corner and there was the biggest dam I'd ever seen. It went on for a mile and it was like 30 feet high. It was stunning. And it had a big house. So that's where we set the film. But how do you check out the house? Like, how do you get. Did you get cameras inside the. No, so here's, here's the story. We had to, we wanted to tell the story from the beginning. So where the young lovers set up camp first. So we built the first dam in a river, the Bow River in Bam, on the edge of Bam. I know, the, I know that, I've paddled, I've paddled that river. Yeah, yeah the, the Bow, it went through Canmore. Yep. So we built our own dam out of plastic. We got it started and then we fixed it with sticks but the actual dam was built from garbage bags. Water comes up, we let the beavers loose, and they started to help. So they would get logs from the bottom of the creek. They took to your artificial dam. Yeah. Wow, amazing. Yeah, and we Or artificial beaver house. Yeah, and we filmed them with, uh, uh, with cranes and dollies and, and big HMI, HMI lights, you know, the arc lights. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to give them the beauty that, the give them the benefit that Hollywood gives their their heroes, right? Sure. So, but that was just the beginning. We 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 built a, a a tunnel system, underwater tunnel system, and underwater house system in Toronto in Toronto on a set, yeah. an indoor outdoor set. So we used the, the aspen trees in the background, but we built a giant tank the glass front and so we so we did all the interiors uh artificially but you couldn't tell wow uh, uh, getting inside a real beaver house would have been useless too so, dark yeah too dark no, oh no, yeah no, you couldn't no light room. it and then the beavers would be freaked yeah they'd be freaked out totally so these guys lived I mean, that's in a the job tank. for gopros and yeah yeah now this was but. cameras of this big sure. in housings oh yeah um, it but was a hell of a job. I mean, were the housing? Who made the housings back then? The house, the, uh, the there were two different housings. One was Marty Mueller, I think, built one out of Oregon, and then were Gates Gates housings around back then? I or are they forget. more of a modern? He, there was a there was one built by a California company, but it was dangerous because it would it was implodable after a hundred feet so that's you had to be good. really careful yeah. uh the cylindrical one that was built later was safer to use okay. um, well you don't want something blowing up when you're holding it it'll take your arms off yeah so and we were we were getting quite deep for other films yeah. so anyway the film came out um and at first uh no one took it in the network because they didn't like the name Beavers. 
Because and of the connotation to yeah. woman's body parts? Yeah, so a woman phoned me in the middle of the night. I was working on another film, a Buffalo film. And she phoned me, I woke me up in the middle of the night. Peter put her onto me. And Mr. Lowe, are you, uh, we love the Beaver film. But I will tell you for sure, we met the board and we will not run a film called Beavers. And I, of course, played dumb, right? I said, well, why? She said, well, you know why. And I said, no, I don't. Tell me why, that's what they're called. What, what do you mean? And well, suddenly she was faced with trying to tell me that, that it was about her private parts. Uh, which would have stunned a guy who didn't know, right? Sure. So uh, I, I kind of, I, I did a slam dunk. I said, oh, that's so sad because our, our um, national animal is, is a beaver. Sure is. And it's on our nickel. And she almost died on the phone. She said, oh, I, I am so sorry. I had no idea that beavers was your national animal. Really? Yeah. This was an American? Yeah. Somewhere uh, in the south. I just got to plug this camera in. So she, she almost cried on the phone. She was so embarrassed. So she said, we'll run that film. And she did. And it became, it became a huge hit. Awesome. I mean, Still running today. Really? Everywhere. Yeah, sure. Let me just get this guy plugged in. So we actually... We actually upgraded it a couple of years ago um, because I, fin I finally did the aerials I wanted. I, I you up, oh, you did the director's cut of the beaver film? Yeah, yeah, and I added some beautiful aerials with gyro stabilized helicopter aerials, oh, which I we see. couldn't do in those days. Up the camera out on the wing. So it's digital now, it's cheaper to, for them to run, and it's got incredible aerials. So yeah, let's talk about aerials I'm with large format film cameras and the stuff you've done. Like the, have you put up? Have you put an IMAX camera on a drone? IMAX capable camera on a drone? No, no. So it would be too clumsy. But you could put a digital, and then you could up. Like you could put a. Yeah, 8K would be great. Uh, we we did 6K uh, with with the helicopter, with the yeah. gyro helicopter. I forget what system, oh, the, oh, what's it called, the... Shot over? Or shot over. Yeah, the shot over can take whatever, almost any camera you could... Yeah, You could, you could probably fit an IMAX in a certain, certain, the big shot over. We did, yeah. we have. Yeah, we used to shot over with IMAX okay. in, the, in the last shoot I did on film, which is... Uh, what was that? Yeah, you know, well, we were filming that Warren Buffett thing in a steam engine in uh, Columbia River Courts. Okay. And that was film, and it was a shot over. Previously, we'd use the West, the West system. Uh, West uh, West, no, it's not West Camp. It's, it's the same company, but it's uh, it was a it was a good system, but they they failed to develop it, um, and so it got clumsy. You know, they got they had, had electrical issues and stuff. So I got sick of it, yeah. and we went over to the shot over, and then and now oh, we're using good. shot over with six and eight K. Yeah, shot over seems like they're kind of at the top of the yeah. top of the pyramid these Winnipeg, days. Winnipeg uh, Center, good day for two six three three five zero two four zero. What's that? Base cam out of um, L.A. Base cam, okay. It developed by Canadian uh, when he was at West Cam, uh, which is called Dada Hamill. Yes, yeah. sir. Uh, for uh, two six three three five zero two four zero. Okay. Well, it was our friend John Trapman at Van Calcini that put us together for right. for this little adventure. Yeah, John's a great okay, guy. We'll up, uh, yeah, we were looking at renting some shot over gear from him for uh, for two months for Nepal, which would have been for an IMAX he's job great. over there. So it was. They really look after that stuff, and, yeah. and uh, he's. Well, you want it? It's so expensive. <laughs> I mean, that cat, that head, just the stabilized head, costs like three times as much as his airplane. Like two, six, the uh, cost of that but stuff. Beautiful. Is thing. Oh, it's it doesn't have the problems that Space Cam. Space Cam had uh, speeds, you know, like it sometimes jerk, you know, yeah. when it wasn't able to go fast enough. Well, so. the the shot over they're putting on jets. You, yeah, you, you yeah, use I know. It on jets, right? 
I've done a lot of filming on jets, but I've used uh, our own mount, which we which we built uh, for Clay Lacey's uh, Learjet, and I've used uh, Space, uh, what's it called, uh, Astrovision, okay. which is a periscope out, out the top and the bottom, and I, I helped Lacey develop a bigger one for Vista Vision, okay. bigger periscopes, but I mean, it didn't work great because of the optics. Optics of periscope. And it's not stable crap. and it's not stabilized at that point. It no, it is gyro stabilized. Is it? Yeah. Okay. So it must be a pretty big, big Yeah, but the gyros are inside the uh, airplane. So you could you could oh, reload okay. the cameras inside. Oh, they, so you're feeding okay, so your the periscope is literally acting like an optical periscope to bring the the yeah. image in. Both up and below. The the trouble with periscopes is just really it's really common sense. If, if you're using very wide angle lenses, well, they don't work because they then have to get as big See as the, the. You have to have a giant periscope, yeah. and then they, the and giant these periscopes were, you know, that small. So you then you need anamorphic, you know, bullshit, and uh, so that wasn't satisfying. But the mount, the IMAX camera on the front worked well, except for bugs. So we we would land uh, with Clay Lacey every. Not just every three minutes, but sometimes every minute to, to get the bugs off. You and had no, you didn't have a window wiper or something. Yes, they did, but it, it, it once you use it once, well, that's it. Okay. And and so, but Lacey uh, had a habit of, of flying uh, on final upside down. So he'd put his coffee cup and he'd say, "Watch this." So he put his coffee on the dash. He's, oh, and he'd do, and he'd roll do, he'd do a roll and coming into the land the Bob every Hoover, time. Bob Hoover trick. Yeah. Like, Those were the days. I mean, if you did that nowadays, you would just lose yeah. your license. In, like it yeah. would be, they'd, be, they'd meet you on the ground and they'd cut your license up into yeah. little pieces. But we did it every single landing, right? Because we're out in Mojave and out nowhere, and right. you know. <clears throat> we're what air? The, what airframe was that? Was that hardware attached to? It was a uh, a small. Uh, low bypass Lear. Okay. And he used that because it had great torque. The, the higher bypass engines, well, first of all, you're not carrying any weight, so you don't need uh, a lot of range fuel. For, you don't have a fuel problem. And the high bypass engines aren't as responsive to, you know, adjustments. He wants a fine adjustment all quick, the time. Quick, fine adjustment. Quick adjustment. So they got more torque and they got more response. The high bypass takes a long time to spool up and down. Yeah, no, I get that. That's amazing. So you're mostly chasing other aircraft with that. Yeah, that we chased stuff. F-15s. We chased um, F-18s. Uh, mostly F-15s. Uh, F. So that film. With, with Lacey, was, I think the last one I did with him, and, and it was Air Force Base, so that was red flag. So we were filming everything that the, the Air Force had, including the stealth. And, uh, they offered me a ride, and I was too busy. I, I kicked myself, because I could have gone, gone to into 70, space. Could have gone to 70,000 yeah. feet. Yeah, they offered me that, but I, it required yeah, so some, uh, some, some medical training. work. Yeah, yeah, some training, I'm sure. Well, they did, we, we got medicals for the F-15. But no, I flew. Uh, you know, I. So were you in the Lear for the film? Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Shit. Were yeah. you pointing the periscope, or you have an operator and you're just directing? No, and I was on the monitor. No, there was always an operator for a Astrovision, but you know, I operated the IMAX camera, so which is just turning. You can only turn it on and off. Right. But um, no, you got to have an operator for any of those gyro things. That you're stupid to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah, I know for sure. Sure. It's like on the drone, we're always a minimum three-person team, pilot, camera operator, and then we got a third person who's just watching spotter safety, looking for potential. Yeah, problems. you don't want to be training yourself while you're doing that. No, and it's so expensive. You want to make sure you get it right. I I worked with some really great operators, like um, on the on. Well, Trapman is is a great operator. Yeah. Um. So did you see to the new Top Gun? No, I, I, well, yeah, I watched it on the Academy, we, we get the Academy oh, uh, streamers, yeah, yeah. 
Um, what did you think? I I didn't like it, the first one. I didn't like the the those brothers. You know what do they call them? They they bragged and bragged. Net. This has never been done before. Bullshit. I I did all that stuff with an IMAX, a real IMAX camera. Yeah. We put a we put cameras in F-15s and we mounted cameras all over. And it's all in the film, we, and we flew them low down in the cracks and did rolls and did all that stuff in the in the pilot's face, and 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 then the the Air Force showed uh, showed the the uh, film to Hollywood. Then a steady stream of Hollywood guys coming in. Now that's a Navy project, but I I had also done that with the Navy. And then they came in and said, oh, this has never been done before. So none of this is, this is all new. We invented all of this stuff, which is very typical of Hollywood. Completely full of shit, right? Yeah, that's fine. It's fine you're trying to sell something and you want to make it sound like it's never been done before. But yeah, it's fair enough. It's just that they're not generous. They're terrified of being generous. To the to the homage to the people who had done that kind of thing. Yeah, no, before. they don't. Sure. They Zero. did do some pretty cool stuff, though. I mean, you got to admit there was. Well, some they got pr pretty cool money. Yeah, they got pretty cool money, okay. and a lot of the helicopter, a lot of aerial time, a lot of jet time, a lot Winnipeg of. Winnipeg Center, Hello, Fox Cross, Pop Delta, flight level. We had a lot control. more jet time than they did. Really? The, because it was an internal, essentially. Uh, I don't know exactly what this, what, the, but we had. I will pick up my complaint. Zero seven, Fox Delta, thank you. You know, we had the U.S. Air Force for weeks at a time, so we had a dozen F-15s every day. I mean, they, they never did that. And fuel was a lot cheaper back then, too. Yeah, and the planes have to fly, and they have to train, and this is an exercise that helps. This is an odd an odd challenge for them. So they, they're, they're tasked to do odd things, the and unexpected good, things. And it's a very good advertising campaign. Yeah, yeah. Very it, good advertising campaign. It was paid for by, by Boeing. And uh, we had a screening in, in the Air Force film. We did the same thing with the Navy. Sure. Um, Boeing paid for both of them, I believe. Well, that was amazing. Um, let me just see if this, this camera started to get hot. These little cameras, because it's sitting up here in the hutch, I can feel the heat coming off it. That's um, the trouble when the cameras are so small, they don't dissipate the heat for yeah. shit, right? So. Romeo and the sky was full. Go for uh, Romeo Bravo Romeo. Romeo Bravo Romeo, I'll lose you on the frequency and on uh, radar here in about 40 miles or so. Uh, my LA Lake uh, frequency isn't working today, so uh, at that time you can consider yourself uh, your radar service terminated and uh, you can change to uh, on route frequencies. Okay, we'll switch to uh, on route. Thanks for your help today. Roger, if you want, you can uh, keep uh, with this frequency again. You'll, I'll probably lose you on the frequency and the radar here at about 40 miles or so. You can. Uh, uh, remain on the frequency till then. Okay, we'll stay with you till uh, we're past Manitoulin. Thank you. We're gonna be on our own in no man's land. Uh -oh. Well, no, that's amazing, man. So the sky was full of airplanes. Yeah. Lacey, who'd worked with the military his whole life, I never seen anything like that my whole life. But we had, we had. Uh, Tankers coming from Alaska. We had a C-5A coming from Alaska to formate on your fighter on your Learjet for a shot, and then went home without landing. From we had, Alaska to, huh? to down to southern United to United Southern United States. We're in the we're in Vegas. Yeah. They brought in a C-5A from Alaska just for the shot, Holy and then went home. No wonder the world's running out of fuel. You, yeah. You used it all up. Well, they're gonna have the hours in the air anyway, so I... Ah, uh, this camera's overheated again. Oh, we'll take a break. Yeah, let's take a break. You need a month to listen yeah. to my stories. Oh, they're amazing stories. I love it. Whew. All right, so it's been another super long day of flying. Well, I guess, yeah. My, for me, it's a super long day of flying. Uh, started the day in Thunder Bay, but we didn't depart until whew, just after 1 p.m. Uh, and then it was about two and a half hours uh, via Sault Ste. Marie, over, Sa over Lake Superior, Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and then we landed in Tobermory. 
Had a little break in Tobermory. Got a ride into town with this guy, Nick, who's, there was no taxis in Tobermory, but uh, there's a guy who had a poster on the, a little hand done poster on the wall at uh, at the airport, at the FBO, it is stuck on the wall saying, if you need a ride, call Nick. So we called Nick and he was awesome. He gave us a ride into town for 20 bucks each way and uh, had some lunch at the brew pub. No brews at the brew pub, obviously, but uh, had some lunch. And then uh, walked around town, showed uh, showed Stephen and uh, Stephen and his wife the uh, town of Tobermory, which I've always loved. I love it up there. And then uh, we all loaded back in Nick's car, headed back out to the airport, and headed off to Montreal. And uh, landed at Montreal. It was fairly uneventful. They put us on a really long, really long downwind. Um, but I mean, they're trying to fit us in with big, big, fast planes, so they fit us in where they can. Same kind of thing when we left. It was like God, we were taxiing and waiting, and it was like 45 minutes um, from when we started up to when we wheels up in Montreal so you know it's good learning with those big airports to uh, budget in more time because you know we're not a priority small general aviation airplanes are, are not a priority at, at big airplane airports like uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau you know Pearson in Toronto uh, Vancouver International those kind of places there's a reason why us general aviation folks avoid those kind of places not to mention it's bloody expensive for the two Drop off and pick up twice at Pierre Elliott Trudeau was seven hundred dollars. So that's a considerable amount of money. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's all part of the part of the plan. I knew I knew it was that much, so it's part of the plan. And uh, it was a great, great trip. Really, really awesome trip to Thunder Bay and back. Lots of sightseeing. Lots of looking at looking at all kinds of parts of the route that I'd never seen before. Um, flying along the, you know, the entire north shore of Lake Superior. That was incredible. Not the route I would normally go, like we were 1,500 feet right, right around the whole north shore of Superior, every little bay and inlet. Stephen wanted to see the train because he used to work on the train, so we followed the train tracks. And the, man, it was just really, really awesome. It was an awesome couple of days of flying and, and hanging out seeing another city, hanging out in Thunder Bay. I've been there before, but hadn't spent that much time there. But uh, yeah, great trip. Now I'm on the last leg, hour and a half. How far from Brantford? We're an hour, just under an hour. 59 minutes to back to base in Brantford. It's obviously night. We were having a little trouble with the GPS. It was acting up a bit with the, uh, sorry, not the GPS, the uh, autopilot, but I got that straightened up. And uh, now we're all hunky-dory. And we're just hanging out, waiting to get home, looking forward to sleeping in my own bed. And uh, getting this airplane cleaned up, man, it's a mess. But yeah, it's a great trip. Having some fun over Lake, uh, Lake Ontario in the middle of the night. It's just me up here. Love it. <laughs>